There's something between you and your goals. The large, nigh impenetrable fortress that holds wealth, power, and secrets. All you need to do is sneak in, avoid detection, and take what you need. We've all been there. We have a problem, perhaps you require an artifact of incredible power, or plans for something secret and dangerous, or just an enormous amount of gold, and in order to solve that problem, you need to turn to breaking and entering. In fantasy novels and role-playing games, not, not in real life, for legal purposes I will state explicitly that I do not condone theft, burglary, or criminality of any kind, even against the immorally rich. Anyway, welcome to this week's topic, how to create heist maps for your fantasy world. In this video, I'll be going into the methods that I use to create a heist map, the details that I include, the tips and tricks that'll elevate your writing and gameplay, and why I go to the effort of making a map when really you could just write this all down. I'm Ryan of the Red Quills and I come out with videos like this weekly, designing realms, kingdoms, buildings, towns, and maps of all kinds for your fantasy world, mixed in with world building and writing tips for your creative assistance. Accompanying this video, I will release a series of shorts on my YouTube channel and social media for further insights and specifics on the topic, and you can check those out as well. The links are in the description below. Now last week we discussed the drawing of town and city maps, and as a part of that I did linger briefly on the topic of creating large buildings and complexes like palaces, museums, jails, etc. There were a few more questions and some excellent points in the comments, so I'll try to address those as I go through this today, but I will leave a disclaimer. I try to make these videos in 8 hours or less, and of about 20 to 30 minutes in duration because of other constraints on my time. I can't just talk about everything that I want to on a given topic in that time, but as I make more and more videos, I will update things, I'll add things in, I generally just give the people what they want, so stay tuned for that. At this point, I've only been going since the start of this year, so just keep an eye on this space. I also have my next few videos planned out ahead of time, but if you want me to do a video on a specific topic, comment it below, I'll get around to it when I can, or I'll add it into something that I'm already going to talk about. So now we're going to get onto this map. For the materials, I'm going to start with a nice blank sheet of paper, A2, 180 GSM in this case, and then I'm going to use a lead pencil to do a quick sketch. Generally. For kingdom and national maps, I'm a fairly big fan of feeling your way through them, but for reasons of architecture and practicality, I would definitely recommend beginning with a sketch in this case. I started my sketching with doing a pencil grid to help me keep my lines and my dimensions straight, and then a rough guide to the building and the rooms using a ruler to tidy everything up and make sure that my lines are parallel. No one likes a non-parallel line, except for trigonometrists, but I guess they're weird. Anyway, I began by figuring out my scale. This is one of the first and most important things that you need to do. I'd recommend getting a sketch of your building done first, and then choosing a room that you know the rough dimensions of from your mental picture of the building, and then working your way backwards from there. It's a little rough as methods go, but it's what I'd recommend if it's your first time. Then you're going to use that scale to tidy up, make sure that your corridors are wide enough, your doors are wide enough, you have enough stairs, all of those details, and then you can get to inking, as I've done here. Now, I won't be able to show you the sketching parts of this, mainly because it's just too messy for me to be able to film it properly. I can't get a good angle with me, pressing my nose to the paper and muttering numbers to myself, so what I'll do instead, as we go this, through this video, is go through the main points to remember in your building in that initial sketching phase. Because once you've gotten to the inking part of the map making, in this case, you've done the hard yards. You really know where everything's gonna go. So we're going to get to filling the building, and I'll add another disclaimer here. I'm not an architect, despite my parents' objections. I have a vague understanding of how to design a building, but things like structural supports and plumbing should be left to the professionals. Generally, though, you won't need to worry about things like that in a fantasy world. Just no one actually build the buildings that I'm designing, please. When you're planning a building for your world, the first thing that you should start with is the topic sentence for that building. When it was first conceptualized in your world, what did the patrons say to the architect? Did they say, I want a palace to inspire awe in my friends and dread in my enemies, or make me a fortress that none can escape from? Starting with a clear concept will make things flow much more smoothly. Other practicalities have to be added in later anyway to make it functional. You don't need to worry about those at the initial stage. It's also important to be aware of the context of the building. 
if there are stylistic or cultural or social conventions that should be included in the building, perhaps a, a household shrine, a prayer room, a bell tower, or separate wings for separate genders. So, what are the, once you know what the topic sentence of your building is, you know what the main rooms are going to be. In a palace, there'll be the throne room or the ballroom. In a jail, they're the exercise and muster courtyards. In a bank, like this, the focus is, of course, on the vault and the front desk. So, in my case here, I have three levels to my bank, the Bank of Indusal, uh, for the three functions of a bank. The basement level is the vault itself, which is the core of what the bank does. It has a main vault and a few minor vaults. The ground level has the main entrance, the atrium with the front desk, the entrance to the vault level, and the exchanges and transactions chamber. The upper levels has the board's chambers, their meeting room and library. But as you can see, far from the only rooms in the bank, the basement level also has a stairwell and a ramp to the ground floor and an engine room. The ground level has an array of staff rooms and meeting rooms. The upper level has a kitchen for the board's working meals. Secondary rooms come from the questions that you ask yourself about the main rooms. If I have a vault, how do I get to it? How do I monitor it? How do I secure it? And in order, stairs and ramp, guard post, and engine room for the doors and security systems. Any building large enough to require staff or host visitors needs, absolutely has to, have an array of practical rooms orbiting the main chambers. People always need somewhere to wait and somewhere to eat. They need restrooms. The staff must be kept separate from the clients. The visitors must feel comfortable but still be monitored. A rule of thumb with large buildings is that you must have a separate entrance hall. Its function is to contain any disturbances from outside, as well as amenities. A dining area, a waiting area, a restroom or two, and at least one private office or meeting area. If you have staff, they'll need their own versions of each of those. If you have staff fulfilling different functions, they may need separate offices. If they have different levels of authority, they'll definitely need different offices. Now you can see that I read here as a guide, and I would definitely recommend a grid, not only because it allows you to keep your lines straight and parallel, but it also gives you a guide to stack the levels on top of each other and make sure that all of the stairwells and the columns line up. Most of my rooms are connected to each other via a corridor. I've created this building in a similar way to how I would have designed a town. Check out my video last week for a few more details on that. But the gist of it is that I placed the major rooms and then made the secondary or ancillary rooms near to them and then connected them with corridors and stairwells. Now, this is not, strictly speaking, what you should do as an architect. If you're watching this as an architect, turn away. Look not upon this. This is a barren wilderness in terms of actual architectural practice. But in terms of designing a building for people to explore, this is a pretty good way. I found this with practice as a dungeon master and as a writer. You can create whole complexes of any type based on this method. Remember that your corridors and your stairs should all be a fairly sensible width. In this case, my corridors are fairly narrow. They're only about 120 centimeters across. This is for security reasons. It makes maneuvering through the bank difficult for someone carrying anything illicitly, and it forces any group to march in single file. That's actually a tip that I got from the designs of British Imperial prisons in Australia. If you want to learn more about defensive and surveillance architecture, there's so much to learn there. Only then, when we place the main chambers, the secondary rooms, and then the corridors and the stairs, can we finally ask ourselves, as people designing fictional buildings, about the practical concerns. As far as I'm aware, that's not too far off what architects actually do in real life, but I was told that by an engineer, and there is an infamous divide between architects and engineers, so take that with a pinch of salt. In this case, however, Practical concerns about a building can be split into two categories. Structural concerns involve the placement of columns, load-bearing walls, buttresses, and other trifles to ensure that the whole thing doesn't just collapse around your ears. You can choose to ignore these in a fantasy world if magic has more of a say than the laws of physics, but cathedrals or mosques or jails and parliament houses, they generally have fairly good case studies in how to create something grand that still obeys the laws of physics. The functional concerns involve the main function of the building and making sure that the practical concerns don't make them obsolete. In my case, with a bank here, the addition of a lot of secondary rooms and staff mean that the security needs to be kept taken into consideration again. 
I added several more surveillance and security features into the structure and patrolling of the building in order to counteract all of the practical concerns that I needed to work around. Now before we continue, I will talk a little bit more about the composition of this map, because obviously we're talking about the the structure and the contents of this map as I go through what you should be covering in the sketch stage, but in terms of the actual kind of drawing of it, let's go into a few details now. So I have, of course, just the planned layout, the blueprint of the building at three levels. It goes the ground floor, then the basement, and then the upper floor as we go across the map. I've also left myself plenty of space for notes later on, which is going to be a big thing for any heist map. Because as you go through, of course, we can add all the details about where the doors are, where the stairs are, where the security systems are, and the guard patrols are. But there's so much information that you need to know in a building if you're going to be breaking and entering into it in the sort of fun Pink Panther-esque method that we all know and love. So make sure when you do a heist map that you don't just fill the page as you would, you know, see an architect's notes being filled. You need to have space for your notes later on. So I'm going to have notes later for the different, the bell pull alarm, the portcullis system, the vaults, the guard rotations, history of the bank, overview of the function, etc, 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 so that uh, anyone looking at it can, in this one page, get all the information that you need. I'm also be going to be having shorthand for how the guard rotations work, where everything's going to be connected to, and all of the details that you would need at a glance. So keep that in mind as you're going through, because we're also going to be taking into account the, the aesthetic considerations. You know, it's uh, obviously it's a bit of a mess at the moment with all these sketch lines and pencil lines. Going to have to erase everything, but you know, it's a map. I want it to look nice, and I want it to be practical at the same time. The idea behind this map is that if you know one of my players comes up to me and says, you know, um, I want to find someone who knows a great deal about the map who can give me a blueprint on it so that we can plan a heist i can give this to them in game or you know you could put it at the front of a book if the book is about a heist anyway let's get back into how to actually structure your building so now that we've placed all of our rooms you can get to the fun stuff the first question that anyone asks themselves when they're considering breaking and entering is, of course, where to break and enter. You've placed all the rooms, the corridors, the stairs. Now you get to decide where the doors and windows are and what they look like and whether there are any other ways into the building. Now, I have a great many doors in this building, of which there are three kinds, so we'll discuss that point first. The doors are defined by their function. The most common is a simple door, which is generally roughly 80 centimeters to 120 centimeters across, or 32 to 48 inches. You can have decorative doors, which are generally larger and often doubled. They'll be about as wide as you like, but be aware that if they are metal or larger than about 180 centimeters wide, 70 inches or so, they will need a counterweight to stop them from sagging or catching. And of course you can have security doors. They're reinforced, barred or locked and generally less wide than the functional doors. But there are other options for doors as well. This building has three doorways which lead into the building. There's a guard entrance on the north side leading directly to the guard room which presents its own problem. There is a staff entrance on the southeast side which leads into the staff area, the transactions and exchanges chamber which is easier to enter but will not be easy to get through without being noticed. And there is the main entrance, which is the obvious entry and therefore the most heavily guarded. Instead of a door, it has two weighted portcullises and an entry hall to monitor everyone coming in and going out. It's the simplest, most direct line into the building and towards the vault, but the whole building is designed around monitoring that door. Another point to remember about doors is that they generally open inwards into a room. So this is because if you do it that way, the hinges can't be tampered with from anyone outside the room. It also means that no one can barricade someone inside the room. There is another kind of door in this building that I have neglected to mention, which is the vault door, of course. Now those on the basement level are extremely heavy and they have intricate locks built in. In my case, for this bank, I'm going to go one step further uh, because in the notes I'm going to add that there is a rumor that the main vault door is sentient. It's a piece of technology older than the rest of the city, which allows your heroes another method of being able to get through it if they decide to go that way. 
Windows are much more up to your imagination. The larger single pane glass windows are very modern. Most fantasy windows will be wooden shuttered or multi-panel glass. In the case of this building, I've not marked the windows on the map because they're 15 centimeters across and they have an iron grill. Remember that windows have functions other than letting light in. Often in a world which uses candles or gas for light, they're an exit point for the heat and the fumes. They allow airflow into and through the building and they maintain the temperature. Buildings designed for luxury will have large windows. Buildings designed for security will have minimal windows. It's always best when designing a building that you intend to have someone heist that the whole construction is a puzzle. Design it so that there are other options than the obvious ones. Doors and windows are the obvious ways into a building but you will really need to give thought to them so that the subjects of your heist have a starting point. Ideally, you'll give them several possible sites of entry, several doors, all with different problems to overcome, some windows, and possibly a chimney or exhaust vent through which a slender or tiny person can enter. Any building will have to let things in and out in order to be functional. The longer that an architect wants a building to stand for, the more they must account for the building to shift and breathe and let the world flow around and through it. Air and water must have their points of entry into and out of the building. If they're not built, they'll be carved out by the elements or they'll kill the occupants. So here are some questions to ask yourself. So where does air enter and exit the building. If a building is airtight and has people inside it, they will suffocate. Even extensive enough mines have a problem when they're not airtight and this applies to any complex if the complex is large enough and has an insufficient air intake. They'll need to be scattered at regular intervals. Windows are the most practical options for this in a building, but there could be other exits for gas such as vents, chimneys or valves. Where does water enter and exit the building. Any building with toilets, baths or showers has this problem, otherwise buildings generally try to encourage water to move around them rather than through them, but every roof has a leak somewhere. How do they allow light in? Candles are expensive and the sun is not. A high security building will do everything it can to make itself safe, but sometimes one has to think about their wallet. What's more, anyone who wants to write things down will need the light of several candles in order to see without strain. And once you've figured these out, you'll have several backup options for entry into your highly secure building. So let's talk about about what we do once your subjects are inside the building. We have the layout of our building now and we know where the entrances are and where the important rooms are. Hopefully they're not right next to each other so that there is at least some kind of obstacle between your protagonists and their target. And you've asked yourself where the water and air enters and exits the building. So now we can talk about moving once you're inside the building. Once inside, remember what we said earlier about the different areas of the building. There'll be an area for the public, an area for staff, and an area for the owners or inhabitants. For the first, you can move around without too much suspicion. For the second and third, you'll need a disguise or to remain unseen. Another issue that you can encounter is guard patrols. This is a complex and intricate part of designing an encounter and I don't have that much time to explore it. My advice for anyone designing these is to try to strike the same balance that the owners of the building would try to strike. You want your building to be as cheap as possible, but as secure as possible. Leaning too much to either way sacrifices the other, so you need to make some compromises. If you find a balance there, then your protagonist will have some difficulties and some opportunities. We talked about it before. Any complex has three different kinds of denizen. The public, the staff, and the inhabitants. So let's go into those in more detail. The public will only be allowed into certain areas of the building, and they'll generally be monitored or have some kind of oversight while they're inside. Moving through or around them is easy enough, but they can panic or snitch if they see anything out of the ordinary. The staff move around with much greater freedom. They'll be uniformed and they'll possibly be able to recognize each other by sight depending on the size of the staff. There may be different levels of authority, which comes with access to more and more of the building. 
The inhabitants come in two kinds, willing or unwilling. Most inhabitants of a building are willing. In my case, no one lives in the bank per se, but that role is filled by the board members who have absolute authority and intricate knowledge of the building. But a prison or a jail will have unwilling inhabitants. They have no authority, but they do have intricate knowledge. When your protagonists are moving through the building, they will at some point have to deal with or avoid the occupants of the building. They'll need different strategies for each in order to avoid conflict or notice. When I design any building, I follow the same rubric that I apply to dungeon generation. The chambers contain one of the following. Ambience, environmental danger, puzzle, dead end or conflict. Now you can flavor these to the context of the building that you're designing, but the different flavors allow you to make a building that is interesting and varied. Chambers can also be a combination of two of these as well. A trap is both an environmental danger and a puzzle. A patrol is ambience and conflict. Work them together to make more intricate problems for your protagonists to encounter. The reason we're all here is the puzzle and the mystery of it. The core of any heist is the something to solve. It's a difficulty to encounter and what we enjoy as observers, as players, as readers or writers is the solving of that puzzle. How best to overcome the obstacles and react to the unexpected. So before we finish up, it's only right to talk about how to create a dynamic puzzle. Now obviously this is a topic that I could talk about for hours. It's the core of any game. People love puzzles and we love solving them. As the world builders we have to design things that can be solved but not easily and it's a hard balance to strike. So here's the different kinds of puzzle that I create in my worlds and encounters. The first is contextual puzzles. These are the mysteries which need to be unraveled. The puzzle here is in the understanding of them and not in the disarming or the avoidance of them. We long to comprehend the world around us and these are about figuring out what's right, what's correct. The focus is the truth. Now you can create these as elements of history, of character and culture. In this map, the mystery is the nature of the sentient vault at the core of the bank and the history of the board of the directors. The next kind of puzzle is a mental puzzle. Now these are physical or logical problems that have a definitive answer. They generally lie as an obstacle between you and your goal. They can be a doorway that requires a riddle, a trap that can be avoided, or even a maths problem. The focus is the answer. You can create these as needing a key or a combination for a lock. You can set patrols to avoid the requirements to fulfill each goal. In this map, the mental puzzles are the patrols, the locks and combinations, the alarm bells and the weighted plates that are needed to enter the vaults. The last kind of puzzle is a moral puzzle, which is honestly my personal favorite. I enjoy adding consequences to the answers of my puzzles. It works for some protagonists and not for others. They are choices between one path and another and the focus is not an answer, it's not the truth, it's doing the right thing. You can create these as making your hero's lives easier at the expense of an innocent or providing the opportunity to punish an evil person at greater risk to personal safety and all sorts of things. In this case, the moral puzzles here in the bank aren't specified. You know, they could be the opportunity to disrupt the plans of the board to help the poor or they could be needing to steal a key from a staff member who will be arrested as complicit when the theft is discovered or things like that. There are so many nuances to puzzle making, so I'm going to simply leave it there for now. But I would be very keen to hear what puzzles you like and tend to use. Just uh, hit me up in the comments below and we can have a discussion. So the shape of our map is really starting to come together now. You can see the footprint of the bank. All of the structural notes are in black. I've used a 0.7 millimeter black fine liner pen for that. And I've got the detailing on that in 0.4 and 0.1 millimeters as well for the doorways. I've noted and labeled each of the rooms and their functions in red. And I've also done the security systems in red as well, as well as um, orienting the stairwells. The arrow always points upstairs. 
but you can see that I've I've started to get here the where the counterweights for the portcullis are where the bell pulls for the guards are how the bell pull strings all connect back to the office so if you wanted to you could uh, cut the line I've also got you know where the weighted plates are to open the vault you need to have two guards standing on them on the level above in order for the vaults to open or at least the minor vaults the major vault the main vault is of course going to be the sentient vault and I'll have an illustration of that as well I've gone through in blue and added in the non-static security features in this case the guard patrols and their positions I've I've numbered them and I've labeled them uh, and in the notes I'm going to add in some details as to how that works at any given time there are 12 guards in the bank four of those will be in the guard room at any given time and eight will be on duty there are five static positions there are one two four and six and three of those are patrolling which are uh, the, the third places and the fifth place you can see the paths of the patrols as well as well as the direction in which they walk and I've also added another detail there as well so you've got the first number which indicates at what point the guard changes and I'll put this in the notes as well and the second two numbers in, in this case it's say 0 slash 30 or 15 is where on the hour they start their patrol so that you can time that for your players so all in all, adding these details to the building have given us an incredible wealth of information and the ability to plan a, a heist in exquisite detail. What door you come through, where the alarms are so that you can cut the cords, how you can distract the guards or eliminate them without the other guards noticing. Everything that you would possibly need to break in and everything you would possibly need as a game master or as a writer to give them obstacles for when things go wrong because there's always the unexpected this is just what they expect you can always add something in later so we've done all of our steps we have a monument now that we can heist from now you've built your building you filled it with chambers you thought your way through the myriad of different ways that your protagonists can break and enter the different kinds of obstacles and puzzles that you can encounter on the inside and here we have our map. This is the bank of Indusal, the resting place of the most valuable and rare items in the world, guarded by a sentient vault and overseen by the sinister board of directors. What do you think? As always for the maps that I draw specifically for these videos, this map is available on my website. Check out the link in the description below. There is so much more detail that went into this that I have not had time to discuss in this video. And as always, please comment if you found this helpful, if you want me to talk about anything else in upcoming videos, or if you have any questions. Thank you so much for my supporters, and I'll see you next week for our next tutorial.